Something we all have in common is trouble, isn't it? You know what trouble is? Do you have any trouble? Are you going through some trouble right now in your life? Job chapter 14, verse number 1, the Bible says, A man who is born of a woman is a few days, and his life is full of trouble. That's something we all have in common is trouble. Well, I want to invite you to turn with me this morning to John chapter number 6 in the Word of God. John chapter number 6. And we're going to read about some other men who had some trouble. But they found the one who could give them peace in the time of trouble. And that's the Lord Jesus Christ. John chapter 6. And let's begin at verse number 15. If you'd like to stand and honor and respect for the reading of God's holy word, feel free to do so. John chapter 6, beginning with verse number 15. The Bible says, Therefore when Jesus perceived that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he departed again to the mountain by himself alone. Now when evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, got into the boat, and went over the sea toward Capernaum. And it was very dark, already dark, and Jesus had not come to them. Then the sea arose, because a great wind was blowing. So when they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and drawing near the boat, and they were very afraid. But he said to them, It is I, do not be afraid. Then they willingly received him into the boat, and immediately the boat was at the land where they were going. You may be seated. Our Father and our God, we thank you for your precious word and what it means to us. God, now at this time, I pray that you'd cleanse us of any wicked thought, any wicked deed, any wicked way. Give us clean hands and a pure heart that we may be able to feast from your word, that we may be able to enjoy your presence, that we may be able to receive the word, the message that you have for us. God, I pray in all that's said and done that Jesus would be uplifted. And Father, if there be one here today that's never received Christ, as their Lord and Savior, I pray through this message today that the Holy Spirit of God would open their hearts, show them their need of a Savior, and that they would come and receive Christ to be their Savior and Lord. Be with your people today. Help me as I preach your word in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm preaching on this subject this morning, the Sovereign Lord Jesus of your storm. The Sovereign Lord Jesus of your storm. We've been looking at the miracles of Jesus. In this very chapter that we read from this morning, we studied last week how that the Lord Jesus Christ has all power. He is the Son of God. He has divine power, and specifically, He has divine creative power. He was able to take the loaves and the fishes and when he broke them and began to pass them out, more and more and more bread and fish was available. He is the Son of God. He's able to make much out of little. He is the one who completes us. He is the one who takes us as limited, insufficient individuals and makes us complete and sufficient before Almighty God. This morning we've read another story, another sign miracle from the life of our Lord. And in this miracle, the Lord Jesus Christ displays His power over creation, His power over the weather, His power over storms, His power over nature. He displays that He has complete power. And in this story, we read how the, the disciples were in this boat. They were in this storm. They went through this time of trouble. But they learned instead of focusing on the storm, instead of focusing on the trouble, 
that they could focus their heart on the Lord Jesus. They could focus their eyes on Him. And when they focused on Him, they could have peace in the time of trouble. I want to ask you this morning, are you going through a storm today? Are you going through some trouble? You know, it's been said you're either going into a storm, in the middle of a storm, or coming out of the storm. As I said, we all have trouble. We have all kinds of trouble. And so I want to share with you this morning some words of assurance that I believe will give you peace when you focus on Jesus as the sovereign Lord who is completely in control. Number one this morning, the first word of assurance is this. Before your storm, the sovereign Lord Jesus is completely in control. Before your storm, the sovereign Lord Jesus is completely in control. Now, we see here in the text that this storm started when Jesus was not physically with them. Look at verse number 15. The Bible says, Therefore, when Jesus perceived that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he departed again to the mountain by himself alone. Now, when evening came, his disciples went down to the sea and got into the boat. So here we see Jesus has went alone. He's up on the mountain. He's there by himself. And the disciples have went away from him for a period of time. And now they're getting into a boat. They're going out on the Sea of Galilee. And they are away from the physical presence of the Lord before this storm ever came. You know, I wonder in your life, when you go through a storm, when you go through trouble, do you ever feel as if you are all alone? Do you ever feel as if the Lord has forsaken you? Do you ever feel as if you're going through this trouble by yourself? Well, no doubt the disciples probably felt that way, probably thought, I sure wish Jesus was here. I sure wish Jesus was with me in this storm. So they were without the physical presence of Jesus when this storm started. Then I noticed something else. This storm came after a long day of ministry. Verse number 16 says, Now when the evening came, you see that during that day they had experienced the Lord Jesus' teaching and then the Lord Jesus feeding that multitude. Uh, the text says there were 5,000 men, not including the women and children. Some have estimated that there was as many as twenty to 25,000 people that were fed that day. And they saw Jesus do that. Why, they saw Him create food when there was no food there. They saw how the people were filled. They saw how that when everything was said and done, there was 12 baskets of leftovers for them to carry away. They had had a long day, an exciting day of ministry. And now their storm comes. And then I bring something out. Uh, see something else that I want to bring out from this passage. This storm came unexpectedly. You see, they were not expecting a storm. If they were expecting a storm, no doubt they wouldn't have gotten in this ship. No doubt they wouldn't have sailed out across the Sea of Galilee. Why, my goodness, they've had a good day. They've seen the Lord perform a miracle. They have seen the Lord do something great in their midst. They have seen people's lives changed by the power of of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yet, now they find themselves in the middle of a storm. You know, that's just like in our life. Everything can be going along just fine, and then a storm hits unexpectedly. You know, we have, the, in the weather system, we have tools and instruments that can detect when a hurricane is coming. We have tools and instruments to detect when a tornado is coming. We even have a certain amount of tools to somewhat detect when a tsunami is fixing to come. But you know what? We as Christians know we don't have any tools like that to detect when we're about to go into a trial, do we? Well, I mean, we can keep going along like normal, having a wonderful day, and all of a sudden we get a phone call. 
All of a sudden we run up on a person. All of a sudden we receive something in the mail. All of a sudden we have an experience at our job or at our home or in our community. Storms come unexpectedly. And then I noticed something else in our text. This storm hit when it was dark. Do you see that? Now when evening came, his disciples went down to the sea. Verse 17, got into the boat, went over the sea toward Capernaum, and it was already dark, and Jesus had not come to them. They're not only in the darkness, and you could look at that figuratively speaking, they can't see around them. They only have the stars and the moon in that day and time. And if a storm's coming on, no doubt there were clouds blocking all of that. So it was dark and they couldn't see. And this storm come on them when they were in the dark. And then I noticed something else. This storm came when the disciples uh, were in the direct will of God. Now, how do I know that? Sometimes people say, well, if you're in the will of God, if you're following God, if you're living for God, then you're not going to have any trouble. But that's not so. You see, even Christians go through trouble. The Apostle Paul went through a lot of trouble, and he certainly was a man who obeyed and followed the Lord Jesus Christ. Why, over in Matthew chapter 14, verse 22, we have a parallel passage of this same story. The Bible says immediately Jesus made His disciples get into the boat and go before Him to the other side while He sent the multitudes away. Why did they get in that boat? Because Jesus told them to. Jesus told them to. And I want to tell you something, folks. You may be going through a storm, but I'll tell you this. Don't let that get you off course thinking that you're out of the will of God. Yes, sometimes God does send storms to chasten us. Yes, God does send storms to discipline us. But sometimes God sends us in a certain path right into the middle of a storm. And that storm is in the very direct line of His will. His will. I think about Job over in the Old Testament. Job in chapter number 1. I read how that he was a man who loved God. He was a man who hated sin. He was a man who worshipped and honored God. He was a man who tried to raise his family according uh, to God's will and following God. In chapter number 1, you read how that he would get up early in the morning and he would make sacrifices on behalf of his children. And then one day the Bible tells in chapter 1 of Job how that the devil and all the angels came before the Lord. And the Lord said to the devil, Have you considered my servant Job? Have you considered him? There's none like him on the earth. He's a blameless man. He's an upright man. He's a man who fears God and he's a man who shuns evil. And the Bible says, So Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not made a hedge around him, around his household, and around all and everything on his side? You have blessed the work of his hands, and his possessions have increased in the land. But now stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. That's the devil speaking. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your power. Only do not lay a hand on his person. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. Notice there, the Lord removed that hedge that he had around protecting Job. The Lord made it possible for the enemy to try him. The Lord made it possible for the enemy to trouble him. The Lord made it possible for the devil to send him through a storm. And what was Job's storm? Well, you read in this chapter... He lost all of his animals. He lost all of his animals. He not only lost all of his animals, he lost all of his children. You know, it would be bad to lose all of your property, but you can replace property, but you can't replace family. And so Job lost his children. They all died. And then you read over in the next chapters, 
chapter 2, how that Satan attacked Job and attacked his health. So he suffered bankruptcy. He suffered bereavement. And then he suffered those balls that covered his body. But the question is, was Job in the will of God? Well, certainly he had been up that morning praying. Certainly he had been worshiping God. Certainly he had been making sacrifices to God. He was in the will of God. But what I'm trying to show you is even if you're going into a storm, before you ever go in that storm, the Lord is in absolute control. He's in absolute control. Why Job knew God was in control, in Job 23, verse 10, he said, But he knows the way I take. And when he has tested me, I shall come forth as gold. Now, I've got to ask this question. If Jesus is in control before the storm, why in the world would he send one of his children into a storm like he did these disciples? Well, the only thing I can come up with is two reasons. He does this so that we'll see Him in a way like we've never seen Him before. And not only so we'll see Him in a way like we've never seen Him before, but He sends us into storms so that we can learn to trust Him more fully than we ever have before. Before your storm, He's in control. Number two, I want to give you another word of assurance from this text in John 6. Before the storm, the Lord Jesus is in control. But number two, during your storm, the sovereign Lord Jesus is in control. Now look with me at our text. There, there in the storm, Jesus is on the mountain. But what is He doing? Well, if you look over in Mark chapter number 6, verse number 48 and 47... We find that as he was on the mountain and as they were in the boat in the middle of that storm, the Bible tells us that he saw them straining at rowing for the wind was against them. In other words, they, the Lord Jesus, he was watching them. He was watching them. Now you remember I said a while ago it was dark. They couldn't see him, but he could see them. And I want to tell you something, folks. You may not be able to see the Lord. You may not be able to understand the Lord. You may not be able to see Him working in your life. But there's one thing you can guarantee. He sees each and every one of you. He sees what you're going through. He sees where you are. He sees you in that moment when you're struggling. He's watching them as they're rowing. He's watching them as they are in a time of despair and a moment of desperation. But Jesus is not only watching them, He's praying for them. What else is He doing on the mountain? Verse 15 said that He went alone there to the mountain. Over in Matthew chapter 14, verse 23, the Bible says, And when He had sent the multitude away, He went up on the mountain by Himself to pray. Now think about that. He's watching them, and He's praying for them. You know, one of the most comforting things for somebody to come up and say to me, is I pray for you, or I'm praying for you. You're on my prayer list. But look here. These disciples were on Jesus' prayer list. He's praying for them. He's calling their name out. He's praying that they're going to be okay. He's praying that the Lord would strengthen their faith. He's praying for them. The Bible says in Hebrews 7 and 25, Therefore He is also able to save them to the uttermost, those who come to God through Him, since He always lives to make intercession for them. But not only is He watching and He's praying, I see in the latter part of verse 17 of John 6 that Jesus was waiting just for the right time to go to them. Now look at that. Now when the evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, got into the boat, and went over the sea toward Capernaum. And it was already dark, and Jesus had not come to them. You see, Jesus could see them struggling, but the text here lets us know that he waited until the right time to go to them. 
He waited till the right time. You know, God is in the business of working on His own timetable. And God's timetable is not always like our timetable. God's timing is not always on our schedule. God's time of doing things is not always when we want Him to do it. But He's operating on His schedule and His schedule is always right on time. When I think about that, you think how that He created Adam and Eve in the garden and they sinned. And about 4,000 years passed before He sent His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, into this world. Why did He wait that long? Galatians chapter 4 verse 4 says that He waited until the fullness of time when it was the right moment to send His Son into the world. And so He sent Jesus. God sometimes delays when He's working in our life. He delays so that when He does, His hand and His will will be more evident and His grace will be more appreciated. And then I notice something else. We see in verse number 19, the Bible says, So when they had rode about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and drawing near the boat, and they were afraid. Here Jesus is now walking towards them and he's walking on the water. Isn't that amazing? Why they wouldn't think at all about getting in that water. If they got in that water uh, lapping up on the boat, filling the boat up, uh, the rain coming down, possibly thundering and lightning, the wind blowing, if they would have got out in that water, they possibly would have drowned. But you see Jesus here, he's walking on the water. These waves are uh, clashing. These waves are high. These waves are raging. But Jesus is on top of the situation. He's on top of the situation. He was on top of the situation then. And He's on top of the situation now. And I'll go a step further. He's on top of your situation as well this morning. And then I noticed something else. Jesus was speaking to them during the storm. The Bible says in verse 20 that he said to them, It is I, do not be afraid. In other words, he's saying, Don't be afraid. Don't be all upset. Don't be so troubled. It is I. In other words, the great I am is here. When he mentions himself, it is I. He is making a statement referring back to when Moses was there at the burning bush. And the Lord spoke to him out of that bush and said, I want you to tell Pharaoh that the I am has sent you. You see, the I am speaks of the fact that God is the ever-present God. God is the all-powerful God. God is the all-sufficient God. God is the God who can meet your every need. And as He speaks to these disciples and says, It is I, He's saying here, I'm in control. I'm the God who created everything you see. I'm the God who sent you in this storm. I'm the God who's been watching you. I'm the God who's in control. And I'm the God who's going to take care of you. Jesus is in control during all the storms of this world. In John 16, 33, he says, These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Jesus is in control during the storm. I think about... What was the greatest storm that Jesus ever went through? I guess the greatest storm Jesus ever went through is when he was betrayed by one of his own and taken and tried there in Pilate's Hall. And then he was nailed to a cross, a cruel Roman cross outside of the city gates there on a hill between two thieves. And as he hung there on that cross, he was completely in control. You remember they tried to offer him vinegar and wine mixed with herbs that was given to those victims on the cross to dull their pain, but he refused that. He was in control all the way to the point of death. For the Bible said right before he died, he lifted out his voice and cried, It is finished! 
I don't know about you, but I've never seen someone that's at the point of death have that much energy to be able to let out that strong of a message. But he did. And then the text says, he gave up the ghost. But you see, he not only was in control at his death, he was in control when he died. The Bible said that he went down into the heart of the earth and he preached to those spirits in prison. He told those who had went to hell that he had won the victory on the cross and that he had made a full and final payment for sin. But he not only was in control on the cross and in control while he was dead, he was in control at that glorious morning when the life of God went back into his body and he rose from the dead that morning. And then he was in control how that he showed himself alive by many infallible proofs over a period of about 40 days upon the earth. One time I read how that he walked through a door there in, in a room to meet with the disciples. And then after that 40-day period, he spoke the Great Commission uh, to those disciples. And then the Bible says that he ascended up to heaven. He's still in control at that moment during his ascension. And when he ascends up to heaven, the Bible says that he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. What does that tell me? He was in control then. He was in control through all of that. And he's in control today as well. Jesus is in control of your storm God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in the time of trouble. You say, well, if Jesus is in control during my storm, what do I need to do right now? What is it that I need to do right now in the middle of this storm? Well, do what the disciples did. Number one, keep on rowing. The Bible here says in verse number 19, so that when they had rowed about three or four miles, you see, even though it was storming, they couldn't go back. They didn't know how they was going to go forward, but they didn't, they didn't want to die. They didn't want to give up, so they kept right on rowing. And that's what I want to tell you this morning. If you're going through a trouble in your life, if you're going through a storm in your life, just keep on moving forward in the will of God. Just keep on moving forward in the direction that God wants you to go. Just keep on obeying the Word. Just keep on praying. Keep on trusting God. Keep on moving forward. Don't give up. Don't look back. Don't turn around. Don't give up. Just keep on pressing on for the Lord. Not only keep on rowing, but I see here that we need to keep on looking at Jesus. Did you notice in the text, things got a whole lot better for them when they got their eyes on Jesus. At first they were afraid, but when they understood that it was Jesus, they were able to move on. Before your storm, Jesus is in control. During your storm, Jesus is in control. Lastly, after your storm, the sovereign Lord Jesus is in control. Look at verse 21 of our text. Then they willingly received him into the boat. And immediately the boat was at the land where they were going. Now did you realize in this story that I've read to you this morning. Jesus actually performed three different miracles. What are the three miracles? Well, we see first of all that he calmed a storm. He, he made the storm cease. He not only calmed the storm, he suspended the law of gravity when he walked on the water. And then the third miracle he performed here in verse 21 is that he overruled the law of time and space. He got on the boat and the text says when they received him into the boat immediately from that point in the middle of the Sea of Galilee all of a sudden Overruling time, overruling space, overruling the distance, overruling how we travel. He overruled all of that and all of a sudden they're back at the land where he intended them to be. Jesus fulfilled his purpose and plan. Where do I get that? Well, over in Mark chapter number 6, verse number 48. The Bible says uh, that he wanted them to go in that boat and then across the land to the other side 
of the sea. He said, I want you to go to the other side. Excuse me, verse 45. Immediately he made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side to Bethsaida while he sent the multitude away. You see, Jesus is able to make sure that you're going to get where he wants you to go. Listen, he's got a plan for your life. He's got a plan for my life. And he's going to make sure to fulfill it. What is that plan? Romans chapter 8 verse 29 says that it's his plan for every one of his children to be conformed to the image of his son, Jesus Christ. And so God's going to make sure that he fulfills his plan. Philippians 1 verse 6 says, He who hath began a good work in you will perform it unto the day of Jesus Christ. He's going to finish what he started. You say, how is he going to do it? Hebrews 13 5 says, He speaks and says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Listen, folks, I'm here to tell you something. You may be in the middle of a storm because this world is full of storms, but you can guarantee Jesus is going to make sure that you make it to the other side. He's going to take you to the other side. And one of these days, folks, I'm here to tell you, I'm not looking for Jesus to step off of the mountain into the sea to walk to me, but I'm expecting Jesus to step down from the throne and to step on the clouds and to come back for every single one of His children. And one of these days when Jesus Christ returns in all of His glory, He'll usher us to that heavenly home to be with Him forever and forever. And we'll say farewell to this world that's full of trouble and this world that's full of storms. And just as He was sovereignly in control before our storms, during our storms, for all eternity, He's going to be in control. And in that day, there'll not be any more storms. Amen? But it'll be ceaseless peace and joy and praise forever. And forever. I want to ask you this morning are you going through a storm? Are you going through some kind of trouble? I want to challenge you this morning look to Jesus. Get your eyes on Him. Realize that He is the one who's in control. Realize He is the one who's in charge. Realize just as He can calm the sea and He can walk on the water, He can bring calmness. And peace to your heart. Are you in need of that this morning? He's here offering His peace to you. Have you ever received Christ as your Lord and Savior? If you've never done that, I want to invite you today to come. I'd like to pray with you. Maybe you're here and you're burdened. You're a believer. You're a Christian. But you're going through a storm as an individual. Maybe you're going through a storm as a family. Whoever you may be, whatever you're going through, I want to invite you to come this morning as we stand to our feet. If the Lord's speaking to your heart and you're in need of His peace, I want you to come this morning. The altar is open for you to pray. I'm here to pray with you as well.